Greetings, Alpine Abbey. I come to you on this final Sunday of Lent before going into Holy Week. Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, will begin Holy Week, which is the true last Sunday of Lent. But this Sunday, I come to you with a heavy heart. Our country just experienced the murder of eight individuals, six of whom were of Asian descent. This happened in Georgia, and it reveals that much of our country has a theology problem. Really? Theology? You might be thinking, really, that's, the, that's what you come? That's the conclusion? Yes, this man was disturbed, as anyone who does a terrorist-style act is disturbed, being radicalized oftentimes by religion. That religion can be a religion of a god, or a religion of statecraft, or whatever it may be. This man was radicalized by his theology. Now, while I'm sure certain rhetoric from pundits and political leaders that have scapegoated China as the source of all of our problems over the last few years may be playing a role in this, but it does seem to be going beyond that. Now, while there's not any direct evidence that this shooter's murder spree was racially motivated, it is worth notifying. Noti it is worth noting that this self-identified Christian goes to a church that is associated with Founders Ministries, which is a ministry that is very much involved with the Southern Baptist Convention and has described terms like white fragility as racism and has called critical race theory, which is a very useful tool for understanding racism, as godless and materialistic ideologies. So... Such views and teachings, while this may not have been directly ra racially motivated, likely did permeate this man's mind. But regardless of the cause, let us acknowledge that even if this was not directly racially motivated, that people of Asian descent here in America right now feel uncomfortable, feel unsafe feel unseen, and feel unheard. Let us hold that. Let us hold on to that in our hearts. And let us do what we can to counteract that. Now, while China as a political entity should be held accountable for their part in the spread of the virus and the many things that happen over there that are not above reproach, Chinese individuals, as well as Asians from, other, from the rest of Asia and people of Asian descent here in America, we must not be scapegoating these people. These people are not responsible for the work of a government, much like the Jewish people are not responsible for, for the work of the Israeli government when they do unjust activities, and we must not scapegoat Jewish people. And that's a big part of today's lesson. Today's Jeremiah text is the foundation of what can often be used as a launch pad for anti-Jewish rhetoric. So, here today I intend to show you how isolating scripture, misusing it, weaponizing it, and the like can cause real harm. Real harm like what we saw in suburban Atlanta. And real harm like we've seen against the Jewish people over the past 2,000 years. Many times by professing Christians. And especially the Holocaust. Now, when we isolate and weaponize scripture, we are using it in a way that God did not intend it for, to be used. So this shooter, according to his roommate, would go to these very massage parlors, and then afterward would feel enormous, enormous guilt. He felt shame. Why did he feel so much guilt and shame 
merciless remorse. Actual quotes. That would lead him to commit an atrocity like this. A murder spree of eight people. Could this have anything to do with an evangelical theology that promotes ideas that's often seen in many Christian books about sex that attempts to protect men from lust by teaching them to, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously teach them to reduce women to as temptations. Temptations to be avoided rather than humans to value. Sheila Gregoire, the author of, author of The Great Sex Rescue, she's been trying to correct the ways that evangelical, evangelical churches are teaching younger generations about sex. And she stated that it's time for the evangelical church to realize that the way we talk about sex and lust and porn poses a danger to women, as the Atlanta shooting all too horrifically showed us. And eight people, including seven women, died because of it. The same toxic theology is the, tox is the theology that teaches us that people who have had sex outside of marriage are the equivalent to a piece of gum that has now been chewed, and your rightful suitor might not want a chewed up piece of gum, or use dirty sneakers instead of brand new ones. This is toxic theology. Toxic theology that does real harm to real people. Even, even a theology that can say that sex is, is designed for within a marital context can do so without this kind of toxicity. So is this an isolated incident of toxic theology, or is this a trend? Let's take a look at this week's lectionary. We have Jeremiah 31 that speaks about the Old Covenant, a covenant that they, the Jews, broke. But now, this new covenant that God will make for them with the house of Israel will be laid on their hearts. They'll be written on their hearts, and God will be their God, and they will be God's people. Now, this is an ancient Jewish text written by a Jewish prophet. So this is an in-house statement, an in-house critique. It is appropriate. In fact, such critiques are written all over the Hebrew prophets. They frequently write of Israel's failures, as mentioned. They, themselves, were Jewish and having this as an in-house conversation. Now, let's take a look at the New Testament. The book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Hebrews, chapter 8, quotes the same verse, same four verses from Jeremiah. Before doing so, it states the following. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with his people and said, and that's where God said, I will write a new covenant on their hearts. The old one which they have failed will be replaced. Look at these words. Superior. Better. If there's nothing wrong with the first covenant, God found fault with the people. What do you hear here? In other words, Judaism failed, and God sent Jesus to replace Judaism. How does that statement make you feel? Judaism failed, and God sent Jesus to replace Judaism. That is the danger of isolating and weaponizing Scripture out of context. Right here, we have just said, if you isolate this Hebrews text, Jews bad, Jesus good. Jews bad, Christians good. So, are the Jews an obsolete people group? An obsolete covenant? And holders of an inferior faith? This is a challenge that us as Christians have to wrestle with, and we have throughout history. Short answer, no. 
first, let's take a look at scripture. Paul writes in his Roman letters to the Romans in chapters 9 through 11 about this very topic. First, Paul says that true Israel are spiritual descendants in the sense of those who believe and follow. Not necessarily those who were born of Abraham. And he upholds that through scripture by talking about how Abraham's offspring, he had two sons of Ishmael and Isaac. Only Isaacs are considered true Israel, not Ishmael's. And then Isaac had his sons Jacob and Esau. Only Jacob's sons were considered true Israel, where Esau's were not. This can sound like Paul is supporting the theory that Judaism was inferior. But Paul warns us in chapter 10 by stating, Don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? Or who will go down to the region below? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and on your heart. That is the message of faith that we preach. See, Paul here warns us against a poor use of theology and a poor use of theology and the questions that it leads us to. Paul wraps up this whole thing in chapter 11 where he says that he believes all of Israel will in fact be saved. So no, Judaism is not obsolete. Maybe we need to stop trying to figure out, as Paul said, who is in and who is out and realize that if Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus, that Jesus himself is the gatekeeper and not us. And maybe Jesus knows who is driven by what is written on their heart, even if they haven't cognitively accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Especially because Paul says all of Israel will be saved. That is not for us outside of Israel, to be wondering if they are saved or not. Because they are still God's people. And our understanding of our worrying about where they fall in this causes more problems than it does good. See, we need to separate this dangerous rhetoric of Christianity versus Judaism from the right question, which is faith-driven following versus faithless rule following or rule breaking. There are plenty of Jewish people who are faith driven and whose work seem to be clearly fruit of the spirit. And there are plenty of Christians who supposedly have God's covenant written on their hearts that do not show the fruit of it and are clearly and or clearly slaves to rules. We see this with the shooter in Georgia. He was enslaved by shame and guilt rather than being freed by God's covenant, despite claiming faith to this very religion that is supposed to be enlightening and freeing for all of us. In researching for this week's sermon, I was looking at some commentaries on this very message, and one that came up was a column by an author named Dean Luking, who wrote a com column on this very text, and he stated that Jeremiah assailed a calcified external form of religion that the Old Covenant collapsed under the weight of externalized, corrupted religion of form that lacked content, and that the ancient nemesis, a formalized religion without God, is still with us. Now, what he said is not untrue if you read it through the lens of faithful following versus unfaithful just getting stuck in the rules. But the way it was written sounds very anti-Jewish. He goes on to say, in contrast, Jesus offers a religion written on the heart, not on stone tablets, sounds anti-Jewish, that comforts rather than terrorizes, possesses a soundness that is beyond political partisanship and welcomes the stranger inside instead of scorning her and her difference. So two rabbis read this and took offense to it. They responded to this column, and I'm thankful for Christian Century for posting this response. They said that Luking's use, therefore, of ideas and rhetoric that come out of the darkest period of Christian anti-Judaism is disturbing, even if it was done, as we believe it was, unintentionally. They continue, For centuries, Christianity taught that Judaism is godless, calcified, terrorizing religion. 
And they, the rabbis, stated that we suggest that Jeremiah and Jesus would be appalled to hear the Jewish covenant with God described in such a context. This column from Luking describes how easy it is to fall back into this pattern of speech and behavior. He wasn't, I think he intended to say what I'm trying to say, that the right question is true religion versus bad religion, true religion being a religion from the heart, a religion in faith in God, rather than checking off boxes and following rules and rituals. Paul speaks about that all the time. But as I mentioned, that can be found in Christianity just as much as it can in Judaism. Bad theology matters. It has consequences. And it comes in many forms. One of the forms that bad theology comes in is individualism. And this is how, often how we in the West have heard the gospel preached. As author Stacy Simpson points out, evangelicalism teaches, a, and evangelicalism is not limited to the evangelical church. It's a concept that can go through any form of Christianity. But it teaches us to individually invite Jesus into our hearts. But as she states, the God of Jeremiah will have none of that. This God has grown weary of people's inability to keep his law. No more will the covenant be written in stone, a covenant which can be external and could be broken. Instead, God will write the covenant on the people's hearts. This is where it gets important. In the Hebrew, God does not refer to hearts, plural, the people's hearts, but says, I will write it in their heart, singular. The heart of the entire people will bear the covenant. The entire people, all of Israel. And as we've learned through Paul's writings and beyond in the New Testament, that includes the Gentiles, that includes us. God writes God's covenant on our collective hearts. This is not an individual religion. This is echoed by Dr. Will Gaffney, who stated that redemption is not personal salvation. It is national, in this instance and throughout the Hebrew scriptures. This individualism not only leads to perverted sense of justice and entitlement that we've seen all over America, especially during our pandemic, when individual freedom seemed to be more important than societal responsibility, but it also might be part of the toxic theology ingrained into the head of this Georgia shooter. His individual needs were fixed by taking the lives of eight image bearers of God. Because his need trumps the greater understanding of society. Good theology recognizes that critiques of Israel were written by Jews themselves. And they are the appropriate people to make such critiques. Good theology is recognizing critiques against others, like the Jews in the stories, are to be internalized so we can see how we fall into those same traps rather than blaming someone else. How do we fall into these traps rather than scapegoat Jewish people? Or scapegoat China? Or scapegoat all Asian people? Or scapegoat women when yourself might be the object that needs to be dealt with? Good theology can be understanding the context behind the stories, such as in today's Gospel reading in John. In the words of Re Reverend Isaac Viegas, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, which was verse 23. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, John 12, 31. Now the people hearing this are ready for a political upheaval. Soon, however, Jesus will disappoint those expectations. He isn't crowned a king in a palace. Instead, soldiers arrest him, torture him, and lead him to Golgotha. He dies with a crown of thorns, not of gold, on his head. This is not the victory or the glorification these people were expecting. Good theology is understanding that our structures today need to be viewed through the lens of flipping everything upside down, as Jesus was not a powerful king with gold, but a king who gave up his life 
with the crown of thorns. Good theology is to see passages today as said by uh, author Robert Roth, who said that Jeremiah sees the kingdom of Judah will have to fall to resurrect the people of Israel. Similarly, Jesus prophesies that God's people, he himself, and the future disciples will bring the fullness of life to others by entrusting their lives to God. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. He's pointing out that death is not the end of our story. And if we entrust our life and our situations to God, that death brings life. Death is not the end of the story, and if it were, Jesus would not be worth worshiping. Bad theology needs to die. So that by trusting God, truly trusting God, and not just our own nature, that good theology, thus life flourishing, thriving life, can come to fruition through resurrection. The danger of falling into the trap of the Georgia shooter is a real danger. Despite what was going on with him mentally, had he been grounded in life-giving rather than life-taking theology, a theology that rooted him in a view where women are equal image bearers and that his lust temptations are on himself, not on them, those eight people might still be alive. Let us pray, not just in our thoughts, but in our actions, for the Asian people and Asian descent people in our communities. Let us welcome them and show them they are valued and that they do not need to fear us. Let us focus on good theology, thriving theology, that brings life out abundantly and let's put to rest this theology of death see you next time